So here I have a representative sample of the Retinet type 022 and uh, I have an early example, a mid-production mid example and a late example and they all have their minor variations. So for the purposes of instructions on how to service these cameras I thought I'd service all three and I'll point out the differences as they go. Now these are date from roughly August or September of 54, roughly June of 55 and roughly December of 56. And the features of the shutters in particular differed slightly over that time. There's a few other minor changes. You can see we moved from black lacquered body edges to pressed chrome trims by the time we'd got to the end of production there. The shutters started off fairly simple. These are simple shutters, um, separate aperture and shutter speed controls. Here in mid-range production we have an EV system so you can set the EV value and then the aperture and the shutter speed move together. And in the later production we have the EV value here again. It's uh, probably a bit of a tidier system and the most noticeable feature here is we have a lot more chrome on the shutter. These pieces were nickel plated and you'll see that between the early and the mid-range production we move from having the PC contact for flash on the shutter body to having it on the front standard here. Those are the main differences but I'll open up all three and uh, as we work through their various faults um, I'll explain any differences I see internally between these cameras. I have to say these aren't the only three retina to, retina, retinet type 022 that I'll be repairing. I have seven others off camera over to the side here and they are mostly early type and a few late type. This camera is the only one I have which was the intermediate type. So the Kodak Retinet type 022. This is an early example and it has features that you only see on the early examples. So let's have a quick look at this. Well, simple shutter. You set the aperture and the shutter speeds independently, no light value system, a flash sync, PC port there is on the shutter itself, is our self timer. This is nickel plated that ring on the front by the looks of it. Body has black edges. The camera back That's actually riveted construction, the door there, which is a bit suspect. I thought that only came in with the later models. Still, we'll take that as we see it. The chrome piece here with the is small, fairly small in diameter. In other words, the chrome doesn't completely cover that plastic rim. So you can turn that easily, which means that of course your thumb could easily knock the frame counter while you're using it. Film reminder dial, flat on the top there, this section. Our shoe, the octagonal style of shoe, it's got the corners chewed off. 
not much else to say. The second type, very much the same, black body edges, same rewind knob style, same accessory shoe style, same style of the chrome piece on the top here, you can easily knock that frame counter. But we have a light value system on the shutter itself. So that locks the aperture and the shutter speeds together. Otherwise it looks much the same. Nickel plated ring here on the front of the shutter. Let's have a look at the back camera back. That's riveted construction there by the looks of it. Let's have a look at style number three. This is an example of the later ones. Accessory shoe is square. It's not, hasn't got the corners chewed off like the earlier ones. Square, like you'd see on a Retinet, Retinet 1A for example. The rewind knob there it's got a slope on that knob that's no longer flat. This chrome piece here now extends to the edges of that black plastic knob. It's got a cutout here so that you can access that to turn the knob. But it's not easy to rub your thumb against there and move the frame counter by accident. Shutter, light value system, much like the earlier one. This is all a bit more swept up. Chrome plating here. All in all it looks a little bit fancier. You'll notice that the camera body edges are no longer black lacquered. They've got thin chromed brass pressings in place there. And the back door. The back door is much the same. That's a riveted construction. Let's compare it to the other ones. No, the earlier ones are cast. I was being fooled by the rivets on the hinges. So, most definitely, the earlier ones are cast. You'll see that these projections here are cast into the, into the back. And on this one, it's a pressing, and there are conical projections there. It's no longer cast. So this is two pieces. The other one was one piece. I was being fooled by the rivets up here on the hinges with the earlier examples. But otherwise, that's much the same. And I expect most of the innards are fairly similar too. So, three different styles of Retnet Type 022. It's worth knowing that there are different styles. Now, that's not the only thing you'll find about the place because someone reminded me very recently that they've got one of these. And what's one of these? Well it's a type 022 but it's a type 022 slash 7. It's a uh, Retnet F. It's even marked there on that nameplate. And this was made for the French market. And I believe the bodies were probably made in Germany. Um, Quite likely the bodies were shipped, pre-assembled to France and the lens and shutter assemblies were fitted in France and that would have been a handy way to avoid import tariffs which otherwise would probably be ridiculous. So this one, let's have a quick look at this. Earlier style, black lacquered body edges, small chrome disc on the top so that you can knock the frame counter very easily. Film reminder dial here is flat on the top and this one is French. That's all in French. The shutter on these ones it says Kodak. We've got one second to a two fiftieth. Our lens and you know, F3.5 45mm, Kodak and a Stigmat. 
tidy wee camera, but as far as I know, only made for the French market. And another one. Same thing, Retinet F. This one's different um, in that it has pressed brass, chromed brass trims, top and bottom of the body. Otherwise it's much the same. The ring here on the rewind is flat. It's not in French. Here's the octagonal shoes. So not the square shoes that we saw on the latest model here and not the same shape as you see on that rewind there. So a bit of a mixture of styles. This one has, this is the later one with the chrome trim around the edges. This has the larger chrome disc here, so it's hard to accidentally knock the frame counter. There's a cutout in it on this side, which allows you access finger and thumb to change it. The earlier type, the chrome disc was smaller. It's very easy to knock the frame counter. So, French market versions, Retinet F. Let's have a look at these. This is certainly the later back. That's a riveted back, and that's on a black edged body casting. We see a riveted back, and the same on the other one. Riveted back, that's the one with the chromed body edging. This, this is the mid range Retnet 022 that we saw earlier. That one had a cast back. So, a little bit of a mix of features there. We can probably work out the dates from that, I expect. But these two, the Retnet F, a bit of an unusual model. You don't run into many of them around the place um, because they were probably made in relatively limited numbers and they, most of them never got far away from France. So that's our Retnet 022 variants. Of course, someone is bound to ask about this one. It's not a Retnet 022. What's the difference? Well, I think this one's an 030. 030 slash 9 or something. This one was made for the British market. It's the later Retinet, Retinet the one that had the nice bright line finder on it. But they made this one, presumably to keep it down below a certain price point for the British market. So where the earlier Retnet 022 variants all had a casting on the front, this one has got a pressed moulding. That's all one piece. It's not the V-shaped piece that you see on the Retnet 1As with something behind it. This is all one piece. They look a little bit fancier, um, but they're not a Retinet 022. I think that's about all the variants we need to be talking about. Okay, everybody wants to skip onto the glamour part of the job, which is dealing with the shutter. So we might as well start with the shutters. This is the earliest of the three cameras, and we need to remove the shutter from the camera body. I'm going to use this tool because I've got it. You can fight with whatever tools and methods you've got at hand. I'm taking the easy route. So looking in here, I can see that my notch that the tool needs to engage, and that was just a bird thumping off the window, nothing to be concerned about is right down in there. This tool will, should reach that quite nicely. Drops into place. Loosens that very easily. And then I will just use the tip of a screwdriver to Loosen that ring up as much as it needs to be loosened. 
and the shutters out of the body. Let's have a look at this. We've got two shims on the back there by the looks of it. Three, there's a metal shim as well. Two metal shims, two paper shims. Put those carefully to one side. You don't want to tear the paper shims. It makes it awkward to get them back in place. Come on camera, hurry up and focus. That's better. Let's have a look at this. Will this cover lift off the back? It will. And we're down to the shutter mechanism itself. That was easy. This is the one with the earliest one, so it has completely separate shutter and aperture controls. They're not linked by the uh, light value system. We'll pop that one to one side. That went smoothly. Camera number two. No, that's not camera number two. This is camera number two. This one here. Light value shutter. Black body edges. This is the intermediate production. Let's have a look at this. that tool engaged, that was not very tight, which is probably a, an indication that whenever the shutter's been out of it before, whoever did the job, and it might have been me, didn't have a very good tool available. Right, so let's drop this off. We have our flash connection. It's got a little screw coming in from the side in that plastic connector and we just need to unscrew that. Okay, so flash wire there is disconnected. Here's a shim in the back of the shutter. There's no loose housing to take off there. And here's that camera body. We can pop that to one side. Which leaves camera number three here. Now this one has lost its focus scale at some stage. That's come adrift of the ring. Fortunately I've got one in my spares that will replace that eventually. So let's get into this one. Yep, I can see where the notches are in my retaining ring. And they fall right at the top and bottom. That one was satisfactorily tight. Here's our shutter loose from the body. Again, we've got the flash wire there to disconnect. My screwdriver's not biting on that. Let's see if we can get into the slightly larger one. Oh, that screw's damaged. Okay, Let's see if I can get that out. Tiny screw in there is broken. 
Okay, and this one, again we have shims, paper shim, and a metal shim. I'll put those with that shutter so we don't lose them. Pop that body to one side. So we've got three shutters and I think we will start with the shutter from the earliest example. This should be the simplest, simply because it doesn't have the, the, the light value system. Uh, although the internals of the shutter are probably very similar in all cases. Right, so we'll start with this one. The strip down and cleaning procedure. Okay, so to get into this one from the front, there are three screws. Hold the focus scar ring in place. And if you like, you can make a note of where one of your distance marks lines up relative to the name on the ring there. Well, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to check the focus after I've got it all back together. So three tiny screws. Slacken them off. Don't remove them all the way because if you drop them out of there you'll probably lose them and they'll be small. Okay, I can lift off that ring. Pop that carefully to one side. In some tray so if the screws fall out they don't disappear. The front lens group should just unscrew. The grease might be quite stiff or dried out, that would not be at all unusual. Here we have the centre group. You can see it's got two notches here and here and we'd like a tool that would engage those so we can unscrew it easily. I'll use these pliers. They were circlip pliers at one stage. I've ground the tips down. You can me two flat blades. Let's see if this will work. Yes it will. Now someone had put a blob of lacquer there, or red paint, to uh, keep that in place. And if that had given me any trouble, I would have put a drop of acetone on there to melt that. But it didn't. That's our centre group. Put that carefully with to one side. And most likely, the front plate should lift off. Let's have a look. It's not showing any enthusiasm for it. No, okay, in which case, let's have a go at these three screws here, here and here. These screws are all quite small, which means that they'll be easily damaged. Yep and easily lost. Let's lift this off with the three small screws sitting loosely in place and pop that in another tray. Right, now we're down to the shutter proper. Here we have a screw that needs to come out. That's the locking screw that stops the 
retaining ring, the front retaining ring, from coming loose. Now that screw is very small, easily lost, and don't bother asking me if I've got a replacement, because I haven't. With that locking screw out, I'm going to unscrew the retaining ring. Now this is locked in place with a little touch of red paint there. And rather than fight with that, I'm going to put a drop of acetone on it to melt that paint. Yeah, a little drop of acetone, that should do the job for us. Here I've got a wooden toothpick and I'm hoping to remove that retaining ring using that. And failing that I'll go and find a bamboo skewer which will be somewhat more robust. I'll find the bamboo skewer. Let's try again. Oh. It's not moving. A little more acetone, I think. That paint's certainly melting. Oh, it does turn, but it's really stiff. Here you can see I've got the bamboo skewer. I'm holding it with a pair of pliers to get a very, very firm grip on that. I'm going to try something else on there. It's, there's obviously something sticking there. It might be the red paint. Or it might just be dried grease. Right, a little drop of CRC Lectra Clean. That was not a little drop. That was a little squirt. Still, it might do the job for us. And let's have another go. That is really reluctant to move. Oh, you can hear that creaking and groaning. It uh, doesn't want to move. Now, if you use a metal tool like the tip of a screwdriver, heavy tweezers or something like that on there you'll end up scratching something when you slip that is really really tight I uh, not sure why it should be as reluctant as one. I hope it wasn't cross-threaded when it was put on. Such things do happen. My bamboo skewer is suffering a bit in the wars here. That really, really does not want to move. Okay. 
I'm going to go and heat that up with a hair dryer, warm that up, and hopefully that'll soften whatever it is that's sticky and causing that not to want to move before I fill this thing up completely with crumbled bamboo skewer back shortly. Let's see if we've made any impression on that with a bit of warmth. Well, it certainly doesn't look like it. Let's try this plastic handle. That's really tight. Done. It's off. And it's usually the case with things like this. You take it off and you look at it and you think, well, what's the fuss all about? I can certainly see something embedded in the thread there. Um, let's lift this off anyway. This is the front retaining plate. Here is the shutter speed settings ring. This is the speed settings cam. These notches here act against the retard gear train here to change our speeds. And We've got the shutter basically open at the front completely, displaced a few things. This little latch is there to stop you being able to depress the shutter release if the shutter's not cocked. Which means that if you could press the shutter release when the shutter was not cocked, it would reset your film advance and then you could wind on again. Here is the shutter release lever. Here is the little gear that transmits the action of the film advance through to this internal cocking ring here and cocks the uh, main spring at the same time. This internal cocking ring cocks the action of the shutter and it controls the release action of the shutter really. I'm just going to unhook this spring from its post here. Usually if you wiggle it a bit as you lift it it'll come off without a fight. Let's have a look at this. So here is our main spring for the shutter. This is what drives the shutter blades open and closed. This one is a little bit tired See if I can get you focused a bit better on that. 